You can port it to VHS. Um, welcome everyone, thanks so much for being here. Um, my name's Nick, uh, I'm a representative and a creative producer from You Are Here. Uh, for those who don't know uh, what You Are Here is, uh, it's a Canberra arts organisation that specialises in artist development through experimentation and challenge. Uh, we do it through uh, artist development programs and through live events like the one you're at right now. Um, so we're uh, at the tail end of a 2018 that we've spent refining and developing our sense of what the organisation does. And as part of that, we've had five artist commissions we've been running through the year. We've approached um, five uh, of our favourite ACT artists and we've um, put challenges onto them and taken challenges back onto us in terms of uh, working out better and newer ways to be uh, useful to artists and to intervene in their practice. Um, we picked uh, Dan Savage to work with for uh, more than two reasons, but the two that I'll mention are um, his tireless commitment to engaging with new forms and uh, also new technologies, particularly in the case of what he's going to talk about tonight uh, in the pursuit of his practice. Also, his commitment to creating work which challenges perception and uh, uses concepts of perception and the perception of reality. Uh, and um, we're, I'm very excited to hand over the rest of the discussion uh, to him to facilitate. Uh, Daniel Savage. Sorry, I'm just quickly pulling up my notes because I'm slightly ill-prepared. Um, here we go. Uh, so as mentioned, my name's um, Daniel Savage. I'm a practicing artist in Canberra. Uh, I went to the ANU Art School, practicing uh, photography and digital media, and I've kind of been expanding my practice since then. As I mentioned, I was kind of interested in this idea because I've been looking into the technology myself, but rather than just taking some money from you here to teach myself how to make AR, I thought it'd be better to have a conversation that we could all learn something from in that space um, and kind of generate it from there. So I've reached out to our three lovely panels that are sitting here with us as they all come from kind of slightly different backgrounds and slightly different fields. Um, and we'll kind of throw a few questions back and forth to them to see what can kind of come out with it. And then we we'll hope you'll stick around afterwards so that all of you can meet each other, you can meet all our panelists, and you can play with some of the little things we've thrown around. So it, you'll see as you came in, there was a few different things on the tables as well. Uh, there's some what looks like illustrations um, and different artworks. If you download the iJack app, from the App Store, all of them have animations and sound. Some of them are great, some of them not so much. But that shows you where people have kind of grown in the past with this sort of thing. Um, and then a very simple one, the ones that look like coloring in pictures are indeed coloring in pictures. And if you add some color to them and then open up, I can't remember the name of the app, but it's on the bottom of it there, um, they will, most of them will come to life as 3D objects you can interact with as well and they'll pull the color from the picture you've colored in and the drawings as well. Again, very simple stuff, but it's just something to get your heads around. If you've never used AR before, what that might mean. Um, so now I'll introduce our panelists. So first up here on my left, we have Shannon Pickles. Um, he is the uh, CEO and lead developer of it's Lightning Rock Studios. Um, and he's worked a lot in kind of the AR, VR, and kind of other like mixed reality spaces within the camera community developing different things. Um, he's going to kind of give us that kind of tech perspective that we thought would be really important because often you see industry and so people with the know being very separate from artists and really there's a kind of a lot of crossover in that space. Um, he actually is based at Games Plus, which if you aren't aware of it, they're the kind of co-working game studio in Canberra. If you've never touched base with them, I would say you really should if you're looking in the digital space, because again, their ideas are a lot of the ideas I think the arts community has, but there's very little communication between the two. Um, next up, we have uh, just Jess Harrington, who's a local Canberra artist who's been working more and more within the AR space itself. She is currently undergoing her PhD in neuroscience as well at the ANU. Um, and I think she's in the middle of writing her PhD? Halfway. halfway through. So we're very grateful that she's <laughs> taking the time out to come and join us as well. Um, and she has several works that we've shared on the Facebook event that you can have a look at as well. Um, again, just coming into this space. Um, and then finally, we have Jacqueline Babington, who <coughs> is a senior curator at the NGA. Um, and she was responsible for helping to commission the recent VR artwork that was downstairs in that space. It's the first VR artwork to enter the national collection as well. Um, I was very interested to get the perspective 
of both the NGA and more of the established gallery community, museum community about what they think of AR, where it fits into the art world itself, um, and what they're doing in that space. Um, so I think we'll just kind of, as I'll get them to each introduce themselves just quickly by their name when they first talked, again, just for our live stream, if possibly it's caught up with us. Um, and then I'll kind of throw to them for each of the different questions. So, um, Shannon, I might actually just start with you as kind of our tech background. Um, what is AR? <laughs> Depends who you ask. Um, so, Shannon here. Look, the, this is a really interesting question uh, because there is different answers that people give. Uh, what I believe is traditionally there's, we refer to immersive technologies uh, and there's sort of three levels of immersive technology. AR, traditionally augmented reality, basically says take your real world space and just add something onto it. So looking through my camera, for example, instead of just seeing this room, as you said, the example of the Pokemon, I might see a Pokemon there. I can't really do much with that Pokemon, potentially apart from capture it or whatever it might be, but you know there is that Pokemon there. The next layer from there is what they usually refer to as, as mixed reality, which is, again, I would see this real-world reality, I would see something extra there, but I could engage in or change what's there in some significant way to change that simulation. So in some ways, that's where you see people might have heard of the HoloLens. That's one of the very classic mixed reality headset devices, and they use simpler interactions like either clicking or pulling, and that's... Uh, minority Report. Everyone's seen Minority Report. That's sort of the classic, you know, you can change, you can shift, you can move around, um, you know, and that's the sort of concept of a mixed reality is you are actively interacting with that extra stuff. Uh, and then you go into virtual reality. Uh, and so virtual reality is, is total immersion, basically. So it's traditionally a headset which covers your entire eyes. You can't see out of it and you're transported into a new reality, basically, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the space you're in, except usually the bounds of the walls and the ceiling and the floors because they tend to be important. So, yeah, look, that, that's my view. There may be some that, yeah, don't necessarily agree. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, well, um, Jess, we might have you jump in there as somebody who's worked traditionally kind of in other medium and then moved into the augmented rented reality space. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about the work you made, kind of the process and how that's really compared to working in other mediums? Um, yeah. So this is Jess for the live stream. Um, so uh, originally I worked in sculpture, a um, bit of painting as well. Um, and that was really, really different to working in AR. And making that transition, I think, um, was really helped by my background in science as well. That sort of helped with the journey. I was introduced to coding through science and sort of took it from there. Um, it's really different compared to more traditional media in the way that I work. Um, in that with traditional media, I would go with the flow a little bit more and sort of see what happened. Um, with AR, I find I need to be a lot stricter. I write myself a lot of myself a lot of lists. There's a lot of tutorials that I watch, and um, I'm kind of on my own for quite a bit of it. Um, so it's a it's a much more procedural sort of process trying to get AR to work compared to a sculpture. I think. Okay, oh, yeah, great. Um... So with that, I might jump over to Shannon again. And um, how do you see kind of what Jess has just described as kind of a, kind of a DIY break into the AR space? How do you see that comparing to what you're seeing as developers coming into the AR space and mixed reality and that kind of thing, as well as what the kind of new programs you see emerging from kind of higher end companies coming down? Um, everyone should get into the space. Uh, I think that, and in all reality, one of the issues we do have is it's not yet breaking mainstream. And because there's not enough people doing it, it's not breaking mainstream, there's not enough desire to bring down prices and look at technology and look at new methods. So I think in all reality, yeah, right? more people doing it, the better. Uh, in terms of new companies getting onto it, in terms of tutorials, uh, look, it's not, it's not a necessarily easy space to work in at all. There is, like you said, there's a lot of rules, a lot of restrictions, and the problem with AR is if you do it wrong, it, it can 
feel wrong. And I, I don't know quite know how to, if I'm explaining that quite right. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It, do, it does not work. And, and, and some of the really good examples of that is you can make yourself physically sick if you do AR, VR wrong. That's, for us at least, as a games company, that's not something we had to worry about before. Um, but all of a sudden, we, we create this VR marble game where you're in a full immersion in a marble. You're going down a roller coaster. I tell you what, we've got to worry about that all of a sudden because we've got these people taking it off and they're white and they're turking around and they're feeling sick. It's like, okay, there, there are rules and there are very strict rules. Some of those are for a reason. Um, but, um, you know, they are trying to stretch those as much as they can. Um, that said, though, some of those things, like it, it, it's, it's bad if the AR doesn't work at all or the VR doesn't work at all. But if you're making people sick, you could work with that, <laughs> I think. Um, that's not necessarily a terrible thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, with that, <laughs> Jess, how have you found exhibiting work compared to how you exhibited work previously, both in far as the audience concerned and, you know, approaching a gallery or a festival when you're trying to explain the work and how audiences are kind of engaged with it? Um, it depends. It depends on how familiar that particular person is with newer technologies. Um, I think some people in a gallery context prefer, rather than just downloading something onto their phone, they want to have an iPad or something there that they can borrow. They are a little bit tentative. They want a demo. They want to know what to expect. And then they'll take that iPad and use it and be happy to go off on their own. Um, with curators and things, I found that it's always good to meet with people and f show them the actual work in action, because um, sometimes a video doesn't do it justice. Um, and probably non surprisingly, Jacqueline, I might get you to jump in there. Both in your personal experience and your work with the NGA, um, how do you kind of see the NGA's interactions with things like digital artwork, maybe specifically AR, but even more open to that, and the VR work for, that you, you recently showed? Was that a difficult process? Did it only get over the line because there was a real world element to it? Kind of, a, what's their view at the moment? Um, it's it it's quite complicated, of course. Um, the contemporary department at the National Gallery of Australia has only been in existence for a couple of years, although contemporary art's been exhibited and collected by the National Gallery for a long, long time. Um, so you know the engagement of artists with new technologies. Not that this is necessarily new, but it's newly available to artists for creative purposes. Um, has repeated itself through art history. I mean, David Hockney is a really good example if we're going to um, mention someone who has, throughout his entire career, engaged with the newest of technologies. So the National Gallery of Australia, just to give you an example that's comparative, um, we have David Hockney's fax prints where he's used the fax machine as a printing matrix right up into his more later kind of iPad drawings. Um, I think even at a certain point in time, he attached cameras to the top of his car and did a kind of like street view Google DIY kind of capturing of imagery. So um, the way there is a part to it that <coughs> the gallery will look at AR and virtual reality as just another technology that artists are now using. So I think it's really important to, although it's absolutely fascinating, um, I think it's really important to also get past the technology and the kind of, you know, the, the spectacle of the use of the technology and actually just dig down and, and say, well, um, for at least from the gallery's perspective or my perspective as curator, is this good art? And what is it doing that a lot of other works in a range of media aren't able to do? Um, and so the, basically the commission that we undertook with um, artists Jess Johnson and Simon Ward, both New Zealand born, um, now living internationally, was uh, a, a commissioned work expressly for the first virtual reality work to join the national collection. Um, but it was a choice of artists not based necessarily on what they were doing uh, with VR because it was like the biggest challenge uh, that they had that they had had to, and the biggest work that they created to that in that point to that point in time, um, but it was based on the work that Jess has been uh, producing for the last ten years, and um, that is actually 
as a, a drawing practice. So it's really fascinating what uh, to see that kind of analog, that handmade kind of, you know, laborious process transform itself into something that's very slick, that looks, you know, like it's been put together um, uh, effort, effortlessly, uh, but in fact it belies a, a, a really laborious kind of uh, commissioning process. So um, in quick answer, like the gallery learnt a lot. I learned a lot as a curator um, and the, I think the artists learnt a lot as well about how to um, deal with larger audiences and how to deal with an institution that is both commissioning and looking to collect works for for the Australian public, for, you know, something that would live for the next 100 years at least? Uh, well, on that, you mentioned one or two things there that I think we might jump quickly onto. Who, maybe, Jess, you could start on this and then we might get some other input as well. Um, where do you see... I mean, we all know artists basically don't get paid, unfortunately, but particularly <coughs> in something like an AR space where... There's a million apps that are out there for free. There's an expectation that, well, you know, nowadays we don't pay for music, let alone anything else kind of thing, or you go through a streaming service. Where do you see the kind of, I guess, the not wanting to have to go into this, but it's a reality of it, looking at the market to fund this kind of work? Do you see different avenues that weren't open to other space or do you see it still falling into a more traditional kind of way of trying to get a gallery and then trying to sell like yeah I, I don't think that uh, the traditional gallery model of maybe selling a work through a gallery that's augmented reality would work so well um, but there's definitely opportunities for getting grants in the traditional way I think um, to produce new work that's um, more uh, developmental or more um, creative, um, the word is not coming to me, but anyway, um, groundbreaking, I suppose. Um, the other options are selling apps on the App Store, which, like you said, there's lots of free apps, but there's not necessarily lots of free art apps currently. So I think people could still possibly make a little bit of money back for their time. You don't think so? <laughs> Disagree? To do not get into app development. Um, <laughs> in, in all seriousness, uh, app development these days is is 99.9% .9 of people make no money. Uh, the, the top 0.01% of people make 99% of the money and they're the ones that are willing to spend multi-million dollars on budgets of marketing. Uh, the App Store is completely and utterly driven around the top rankings, the top 10 of the day, the, the top 10 most played of the day. Don't get me wrong, there's always outliers. There are always people that somehow get incredibly lucky. Uh, it's not a sustainable thing to get into if you have no money to start, if that makes sense. Um, so. What about teaming up with tech companies and get, getting sponsorship to do new things? Uh, yeah, yeah, look, potentially. Uh, I think what's potentially interesting is in terms of the art stuff, if you do, if you've got an innovative idea and you can take that to a publisher, for example, mm -hmm. there's a lot of publishers that know the app market, they know the people to talk to, the ways to get you into those top rankings. That's definitely a good avenue to go down to. Um, but, I mean, we, we don't personally touch it and, I mean, we recommend that people that are just breaking in, that's not, that's not the place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, I think it's about 3,000 new apps per day. So I might talk about that when we talk, your chest, you mentioned there, partnerships. So um, for people who aren't familiar, I mean, anyone, anyone who has picked up Snapchat and who's seen one of the videos where it's somebody who's put an animal mask on their face, that's augmented reality. And arguably, it's one of the largest augmented reality platforms that are out there. <laughs> they tried to launch that as a art, like a side art platform alongside that called Art Snapchat and commissioned Jeff Koons to make digital versions of his balloon sculptures that you could go to uh, Central Park in New York and see one geotagged in the space. One was going to be on the Sydney Opera steps. Um, there was very quickly protests against that as well, and somebody made a graffiti digital version and put it there first kind of thing. <laughs> but um, it, it seemed to... I tried to find out whether they even actually launched it, um, and I can't really seem to find that. Um, but then... They have launched their, um, what I think they call them lenses. So lenses are those little face things you can get and you can, anyone can make one, anyone can put it on the store. Um, you can get revenue through them if they get popular enough or things like that. But there's 
technically you can make art interventions in that space. They don't have to be based on your face. They can just be objects that can go out into the space. So with something like that, do you, Jess, would you, do you see a space in that for you? Do you feel that's too much noise? Where do you kind of see yeah, that fitting I think, in? I think definitely. And I think, um, I know Shannon talked about people needing really, really big budgets to make a lot of money from an app. And I guess that's true maybe in the traditional game space. But I think the art space is maybe a little bit different. It's a different sort of a crowd. Um, so I think it's definitely possible. Um, Jacqueline, I might get you to jump in there. Where do you see the space of galleries fitting in to publish something, particularly something like AR or possibly a virtual reality world that isn't tied to necessarily a real world object? Where do you see the role of galleries fitting in to be them being able, uh, taking on their role as, you know, the, the unspoken kind of rule that they're there for bring art to the people? <coughs> where do you see galleries fitting in that space where you can now bring art to the people? without them entering your building if they just say go onto your website and download an app? Well, the NGA hasn't done any augmented reality. We have only um, uh, commissioned and acquired the virtual reality work. Not that um, augmented reality won't be part of uh, things that we would consider, but um, I suppose the augmented reality um, Projects that we have considered um, have been more in the marketing field, um, so that's probably an area that's that that uh, that would be of benefit to the audience and the gallery and um, artists that are uh, commissioned to do that. Um, what's really interesting is I think that the gallery is taking artists who are producing, say, virtual reality, for example, and. Um, <coughs> Really, it's it, it's still coming through as a traditional, uh, an extension of the genres or the or the methods of working that we usually uh, that we usually follow with artists. So there's nothing. I don't think. I mean, we're not bringing this work in to catalogue it in any, in any different way, to deal with it in a different way. Um, the Terminus exhibition is actually going to tour uh, as a travelling exhibition, like all of our other travelling exhibitions. It will go on tour around Australia for two years. Um, the one one benefit that I see with this kind of work that we that we haven't been able to uh, perhaps um, reach with other artworks is in the travelling exhibitions field. So we are able to travel the virtual reality project to uh, regional centres that wouldn't otherwise be able to take our paintings, our sculptures, our photographic works due to the environmental conditions that, uh, you know, predicate that kind of um, exhibition. So uh, I think in that way this is has a much greater um, accessibility. Um, Jess Johnson and Simon Ward's project is currently in part um, on uh, dis in display on display in Jakarta at the National Gallery as part, part of a um, Instrumenta new media festival. Um, so already it's kind of touring internationally in a much cheaper uh, version um, than we would otherwise be able to do. Sending a painting, for example, to Jakarta uh, it requires a lot more funding and a lot more kind of uh, a staff input. Yeah, I think that's what I was kind of getting to. If you say if uh, Jess had made a work where you didn't need a physical object, all you needed was a headset or a phone yeah. um, and they could watch it, do you think that's something that the NGA would then just make freely available to anyone who wanted to use it at any time? Or do you think there's still some level of curatorial control, I guess, for lack of a better word, that the gallery feels that it has to have over its work about who can see stuff in a certain space? No, I think it's more about what the artist's intentions are. So, um, you know, the NGA just tries to be responsive to what artists are producing. We're not dictating what artists should be making for our purposes, even when we're commissioning a work. It was all artist-led, <coughs> uh, within certain parameters, of course. But um, so Jess and Simon were very firm about a stepped process of immersion into the Terminus work. Um, and if any of you have ever seen uh, one of Jess's installations, 
Um, she starts with the two-dimensional drawing and then it might go into a three-dimensional kind of architectural build within the space uh, that incorporates her 2D kind of um, uh, work and then they spoke about the next dimension of immersion being into the virtual reality which is the full uh, immersion sound as well as vision. So, But that for them at least was a very important stepping, uh, stepping into the immersion. Other artists do it in different ways. Um, like for example, say a good, a good example might be Jordan Wolfson who the American artist who uh, at the Whitney Biennale just had the headset without any warning apparently um, and people immerse themselves in this very, very, very violent scene and were kind of ripping the headsets off as you were mentioning earlier, kind of feeling sick in a different way. Um, so it's, I mean, it's also about the, ex it's about the experience that the artists would like the audience to have rather than the the NGA saying, oh, well, this is a cheap way to present artwork. <laughs> cool. Although it is. Uh, well, now that, we've meant, now that we've mentioned the audience, that might be a good place to jump onto then. So, Jess, what do you, I guess, what did you see as the audience response <coughs> to your work and the type of audiences that engage with the work compared to what you've kind of made previously? Um, it depends on where I was showing it. So I've shown AR in a traditional gallery space, which um, usually attracts a traditional sort of gallery audience. But I've also shown my work at festivals like Art Not Apart, and that got a really diverse sort of um, range of people coming into contact with the work. Um, I got people using AR who had never used AR before or had even um, people who admitted to me that they don't usually go to galleries but they thought that AR was really cool. <laughs> um, they were more from the gaming side. Um, so it was much more diverse in the public space, yeah. Um, Shannon, I might get you jump in there as well. What do you kind of see the audience and being for AR at the moment, I, like I mentioned before? Is, is there kind of a sense that it is just the new fun thing? Does it seem to be actually engaging with audiences and bringing more people into the space? Yeah, um, sorry for dying everyone, my kid gave me something over the weekend. Um, education uh, is actually the space where we're seeing massive interest at the moment in the AR space because with AR and with MR and VR, you can teach and demonstrate abstract concepts, uh, something that's usually extraordinarily difficult. Uh, a good example we've got is that we just recently did some work with the local CIT um, teaching construction students. And the reason that's interesting is because these are, these are not tech guys. These are the big burly guys that are out there doing building sites. But the reason that AR is very good for them is because they're kinesthetic learners. They're learners by being in that space, seeing things, doing things, you know, feeling things. Uh, they're not good at textbook learning. Uh, and so learning the different construction standards was incredibly difficult. Uh, but creating a situation where using an, an AR HoloLens, they can visualise in the real world, in real world scale, uh, an actual digging, digging a ditch, building a concrete slab, you know, doing whatever that might do, all of a sudden is a complete game changer. Uh, and that's been really exciting. We've already actually seen some real hard evidence uh, from professors in these tertiary institutions seeing that with the use of AR and VR, abstract learning um, can be increased basically or, or getting abstract concepts uh, can be easier. Talking about the, the tech as well, then you mentioned that you were making that with the HoloLens. Um, I have heard some criticism, especially around things like the mixed reality HoloLenses, or even the fact that when you use AI, you have to pick up a phone and put yourself between whatever your experience. Do you think the technology is that isn't quite up to what we're trying to get to yet, that it's almost becoming a roadblock, or do you think it's just a comfortable step on the way to where we're kind of getting? Uh, yeah, look, there are some clear limitations, primarily being field of view. Um, so, for example, with the HoloLens, uh, which is one of the better ones out, you only have a maximum 30-degree field of view. So if I was looking at the room right now, I'm sort of you know, cut in that direction. Anything outside of that, you can't simulate something onto. Uh, Magic Leap's only 40 degrees. I think that's a limitation, but it's a limitation because people want to see more. So I see it as sort of a gateway, but there's more to come. Um, Jacqueline, in a, in a kind of similar way, did you find that with the, the VR artwork that, that was installed in the gallery, that people saw 
Did they see the, the tech as just a novelty? Did they see it as an impotence at all, stopping them from engaging with the work? And equally so, I guess, outside of the audience, do you think there's any kind of perspective from within, I guess, maybe the arts community or more the critical arts community that because it relies on things like certain levels of technology or, say, relying on your phone for an artwork, that it doesn't quite meet the same standard as the more traditional kind of high arts? Or do you think that people are very quickly just accepting of it and kind of bringing it into the fold? Um, yeah, I think people are pretty quick at accepting all sorts of new things. Um, I was really interested in that the gallery thought, I think, generally, that in uh, commissioning a virtual reality work for, uh, for the collection and exhibiting that for four months, then the expected uh, audience would be of a younger generation. But actually the older generations really were, you know, it was, a, it was, it was fantastic to see um, people who had not actually ever used a headset, used Oculus Rift or um, anything like that before, um, how quickly they adapted to it and they learned to love it. Um, they became addicted to it almost. I think um, the Terminus uh, project was in five different uh, sections or realms if I'm using the artist's kind of um, uh, terms. And I think that... We had visitor experience staff who would explain uh, what to do and how to kind of, you know, immerse yourself, how to kind of uh, register with the camera and what to expect. But after that basic introduction, most people were really great. And um, what, I, what I really got a kick out of was uh, that it was such a kind of collective activity people were bringing their families in people were bringing their grandparents in people were coming back nine times I mean that kind of stuff doesn't really happen with more traditional uh well a lot of traditional artwork um so it was something it was definitely <coughs> something that people could share as well and uh so there was you know there was that fascination with the newness of it but actually people kind of got over the fact that it was you had to have a headset. Um, I don't think that was in any way a barrier. Okay, great. Um, I might jump onto the third question then that I kind of had where we're going over things. So this is kind of, I might start with the, the audience level of it. So there's an idea as well to, to some people throwing out there that things like particularly augmented reality work or work that you engage on your phone, a web browser-based work, anything like that, um, compared to VR, although that is getting a bit more cheaper and kind of more democratic, that um, this has the ability to make art more kind of like democratically available and engage with audiences that can't traditionally engage with work. Um, so whether that is, uh, you know, people with disabilities, people from remote communities, people who don't traditionally feel comfortable entering a gallery space or don't have the time to enter a gallery space. Uh, people from different language backgrounds where you can easily adjust things on the fly through a digital artwork to adapt to uh, you know, inputs into it. Um, I might jump across all three of you on this one. Where do you see this kind of digital technology, digital artwork and AR working to expand audiences kind of going over the next coming years? Shannon, do you want to start or? Go on, thinking about that. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think two paths. Um, more immersive but more social at the same time. I think those are actually two important aspects. I mean, one of the things we're really strongly trying to focus on at the moment is actually uh, multiplayer scenarios. Like we want we want to be able to create these virtual and these these augmented simulations, but we want multiple people to be able to engage at the same time because it's it's all very well if I can see the pink teddy bear in the middle there, but how cool is it if half a dozen other people can see that pink teddy bear and if I change that, everyone else can see me changing that and then other people can join in and they can put their own teddy bear in. And to me, that's where it starts getting really exciting and I think that, that that's, that's, yeah, that, that's the next step that we're wanting to take. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Shannon. I think developing the interactivity in terms of AR would be amazing, um, especially we can have that multiplayer thing with lots of people interacting. Um, the other thing is I would really love to see um, AR becoming a much longer experience, like almost like watching a film. If you could get people rather than just looking at a few different things and going, oh, that's cool, oh, that's interesting, wow, look at that, but actually going on a journey that might last, you know, 40 minutes to an hour, um, I think that would be really great. 
Um, just probably just a little alternative perspective, at least in uh, my discussions with um, Jess Johnson and Simon Ward. Their, uh, their artwork was not interactive at all and they were very um, – they were very vocal about it never being interactive uh, because they didn't want people to come in and for all of the um, social, political power structures of our world to then be played out in the virtual world. So they were very... Um, uh, uh, they were very clear about it being an invitation to experience another world where you weren't actually you were you were experiencing it, but you didn't have the same autonomy. Um, so there are artists that are mindful, and maybe that goes to the kind of ethics of things as well. And um, you know, when we transport people um, to different spaces, then um, how does that change how we all start relating to each other as human beings and how we respect? Create creativity and and artwork. Well, uh, we might kind of slide into that then as well. If we were to talk, this is probably getting a little bit more academic than practical on the side of it. But I guess it's it's a very important question to have the ethics of augmented reality art or digital art and the the digital space. Um, so anyone who went on the Facebook page, or if you do, you can go on later. You might have seen that there was a group that to protest a Jackson Pollock exhibition at MoMA. They developed their own AR app that interfered with the work that already existed in the gallery space. So if you hold up your camera, the whole thing gets kind of torn apart and creates their own work. So there's that that question. What what are the ethics when you can, I guess, almost distort other people's images or other people's world over the top of them, whether that's in a gallery space or in the public space. I mean, if you can hold up your camera and it could do something to Parliament House or an individual <laughs> and without getting too creepy, but I think it's an important thing to touch on the idea of deep fakes, if anyone has looked into that at all, is a very disturbing dark end of AR that seems to, the internet has seemed to have found very quickly. Um, and then the other side of it is uh, who's responsible for digital space, who's responsible for maintaining it, who's responsible for cleaning it up when you can write something in a digital space and somebody else can come across it who's responsible for cleaning up that space if there's something there that's not okay? What do, you, what do people think of those different? Very practical example. Um, it's going to sound odd. We were contacted by ACT Cemeteries uh, and we proposed to potentially create something we call a virtual memorial program for them, which is around tombstones. They might have AR poems, images, flowers, whatever people could use, you know, GPS tracking to put it up there. It seemed quite a lovely concept. But the thing is, we said practically, who is going to be the person that, that monitors and approves every single submission? And was a case, well, well, what do you mean? And it's, well, you know, for, for better or worse, there will inevitably be grave sites that are pil filled with pictures of penises all around them. You know, it, to use the very abstract thing, that's just what people do. Um, they do stupid stuff um, because they can uh, and because they've got an anonymity to do that. So, but practically then becomes the flip argument, well, anything then that gets put into that virtual world has to be monitored every single time, every single submission. And that can become an extraordinarily both onerous task, but also a very grey area in terms of, well, is this or is this not appropriate for me to, to say yes or no to? Who makes that call? Is this art or is this smut? Or, you know, and, that, and that starts becoming a very difficult one. Jess, is it something that's kind of come up in your work so far or? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I don't know if there's an easy answer to it. Um, the only way I can sort of think that there might be something around it is it's sort of like with your Facebook posts, you can have things that you approve before they go on your wall or whatever and you could have some sort of system like that if you're an artist creating an app where you approve things before they're there so you don't have to go hunting around your app to see if there's anything that you want to get rid of. Um, but yeah, I think there's no easy answer for that one. I mean, it is a very back and forth thing about is it the artist's responsibility or the individual's? Because even in, for example, an app like Matter that you've made previously where you can draw yeah. in public space, if I draw something that's offensive but then I record it on my own camera even yeah, though no one can true. see it and publish it. 
That's true, but it would be the same as me producing a box of pencils and you could draw penises anywhere if you like. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good my point. fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jacqueline, I'd get you to jump in there as well. So what is this something that the NGA has kind of looked into? Is it something that they look into generally with their own stuff? I mean, uh, presumably the NGA has a Facebook page and it monitors all its posts. <laughs> it's just uh, yeah, it's that. monitored as a public space, um, as every other institution would monitor it. Um, but what, I've, what I do find interesting with the Jackson Pollock uh, kind of example is just another way of appropriating um, and, you know, all of the copywriting and the approvals and the licensing, et cetera, that accompany any image in the public domain would probably be applicable to an augmented reality. Or, um, so I'm not sure. I think that our pre-existing um, ways of dealing with images can be applied uh, or can be extended in their application to... Um, what we're seeing with augmented reality and virtual reality. I don't think we need to, you know, throw it all out the window and start again from scratch. Um, I think it's just a <clears throat> it's an extension of what we already have. Cool. Um, and then I guess the other side of it is the idea of what's our ethical or mor moral responsibilities as individuals when we're creating artworks or applications that... Um, literally manipulate people's perceptions. So I guess to some degree more so in a virtual reality space where you can be isolated, but also in an AR space where you can add objects possibly very soon to a degree where you don't know, I guess with like the deep fakes a little bit, again, not going into there, where you don't know if it's real or not when you're looking at something in a space. Um, have any of you dealt with kind of these I think I was sure that Jess, you might have, especially around your kind of degree and that kind of space, because I do know other artists have like you said, some are very controlling of what they enter. Some people step things into processes. Some people just throw it in and say, like the work you mentioned, yeah, you <laughs> deal with it. Um, and is it kind of that it's maybe it's just going to end up, people are going to keep pushing the bounds until we get somebody coming out of, with PSD and sues somebody about being like traumatically disturbed by an artwork? Yeah, I mean, it's possible. Um, I think from a neuroscience sort of perspective, I think it's really interesting about the sort of possibilities where um, that distinction between augmented reality and your actual reality is blurred. Um, but currently this is all still done through a screen um, and I guess it's like with any sort of consumption of digital media, you know, you have to know your own limits, I guess. Um, but then as well, it's tricky because children can also access this content as well. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that's the exact point I was actually going to gonna step into. I think that that's the, the age limit on kids using VAR hasn't really been firmly established yet. There's a couple of companies that sort of have a suggestion of nine plus sort of thing. But uh, I think it's, it's very different at a very young age where the cognitive development hasn't quite set firmly in place yet. I'm actually a little bit worried about, you know, if, if a five-year-old extensively uses VR, which has creates a very altered sense of reality and stuff, what does that have? Because it's very immersive. The type of reality you experience in VR is not the same as watching TV or, or playing a game. It's, it's much more so. Um, you know, it's, it's a very practical example because I like practical examples. Um, I took my, my son out to the office the other day and he's three years old and I, I had to debate very heavily. I created a very simple dinosaur VR. He could put on these goggles and look at dinosaurs. Um, and of course, because I want to be a cool dad, I let him put it on for about three seconds. Um, but within that three seconds, he was already stamping on the ground to try and stamp on a dinosaur. Um, he was already going like this to try and to try and grab a dinosaur. And I went, okay, we need to wait quite a few years because he he, he still he couldn't quite understand this wasn't real. Mm -hmm. So I do think that's probably going to be an area where the ethics of VR with children will become quite interesting. There's also quite a lot of research going on at the moment in both neuroscience and psychology of how AR is affecting people. So it will, we'll find out more, I guess, as time progresses. Yeah. We, uh, the National Gallery of Australia did actually receive a complaint, not about, this is interesting, not about AR, uh, not about the virtual reality work, but about an immersive 360-degree uh, digital 
uh, moving image work that I had in a, a show called Hyper Real. Um, so, again, we already have these artworks um, being produced. I know there's been a series of complaints about nudity in the gallery and penises. Um, whether it's in another form or it's immersive, does it really, I don't know. Like, I think this, the same rules apply and the care of duty um, – for younger audiences, you know, it's it's across it's across everything that we do. Is there um, <laughs> is there any kind of conversation, I guess, between galleries themselves about the ethical considerations? I guess it actually almost falls more in line with, I get almost like performance art experiences that happened more maybe more in the seventies and eighties where they started getting quite like Mike Parr. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> something like that where you have him in a space when you have that and possibly, say, a VR experience where there's real-world elements as well. Is there already an ethical framework set up where you kind of, it has to go through checks before it's allowed into the gallery space? So it's a thin, it's a thin line again about censorship and um, what's appropriate for certain audiences. We just use warning signs and it's uh, warning signs on the website. It's warning signs at the ticket desk before you buy a ticket. It's uh, visitor experience team members kind of alerting you to the fact that there's sex in this performance work or sex in this video or sex in this virtual reality kind of experience. Um, yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh, well, we'll start wrapping up a little bit, but I might actually get each of you individually to kind of talk about it, uh, a few questions that I had. So, um, Shannon, where do you see as being kind of the ideal for where this whole thing, kind of like AR, mixed reality, virtual reality is going? Do you see it being the, you know, matrix pod chair that you jack into and then you just live in that world do you see it being the hollow deck from like star trek where you live in that world uh like haptics where do you actually see i guess ideally where this is going and practically where it might actually be going where it can actually become an integrated part of reality because i mean i guess one thing we haven't touched on as well that is if you are using things say from your phone we already know they're using our data as they know where we are and where we've been they know what we kind of do the first time you go to type in your address in your Google Maps and it asks you if you want to go home. It kind of freaks you out a little bit. Do you see this as kind of moving into a, a comfortable space with us? And where do you see that being ideally? Or do you see us possibly breaking away from it where we, you know, we start to attack the AR news readers that are starting to come out and things like that and want to go back to the good old days when it was just people making art and board games? Um. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Look, uh, ask every generation above you and they'll tell you the generation above you said the same thing, that it was better when we were kids. Uh, look, th that being said, we are getting fatter and lazier uh, on average. Uh, I, I do very much not want this next stage to make us more sedentary as a lifestyle. I, I want this to be something that can enhance our lives and I think there is a lot of opportunity for it to do that. Um, you know, I, I do think in the art world and in the educational world, there are massive opportunities. Uh, there are opportunities, for example, to in both with abstract things to teach people abstract concepts, but also to use it to demonstrate and teach people things that would otherwise be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to do. For example, in the medical world, they're using AR already to teach people how to do autopsies because cadavers are incredibly hard to come by. In the construction world, they can teach people to see what a failed concrete slab footing would look like, whereas in the real world, you would never possibly pay someone to create a failed concrete roof. You know. So those are the types of things and areas where I think this is really exciting. I, I think uh, HUD overlays, I'm not sure if... It's like a heads-up display, so I, I think it will be controversial, but I think they we're probably going to see them on windscreens within the next 20 years, and I think that could be quite interesting. So even if it's as simple as your fuel odometer doesn't necessarily have to be this static thing, it might be part of the, the smart glass that's on. We've already got you know smart glass in phones. I don't think that's far away. That's potentially something like that. Um, you know, and and with the with that, I suppose comes a host of issues. But you know, I think that's the top of things, and even on your fridges. You know, smart fridges with sort of heads-up displays, that sort of thing. All right. Uh, Jacqueline, I might drop it in you there. What do you see now that you have the gallery has, has had this experience with kind of a VR work, um, that it, by this also, the sounds of it, it did go quite successfully. 
um, and with even things like the um, Team Lab gallery open in Japan and Mori, where the entire gallery is these immersive, interactive experiences. Where do you see augmented VR digital art kind of going within the gallery space as well? Do you think it is going to be something that eventually you'll have a curator of digital art or that you have a digital art biennale or do you just see it as sliding into its natural place within the gallery context alongside all the other kind of mediums? Um, I think people, <clears throat> definitely in looking at the difference between the 20th century and the 21st century, there's been this kind of gradual breaking down of the back of the frame, you know, that, 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 that separates the viewer from the artwork. So more and more, I mean, we look at, um, say, something that we're about to launch, the Ayo Kasama, uh, for instance. She did that, you know, she's been doing that since the 60s. Um, so our virtual reality just takes out that one step further into a full kind of body immersion visually that makes you feel um, like you've stepped into a Yayo Kasama kind of, you know, artwork without having to actually do that. Um, so the demand from the audience is there already. I think it's always been there um, or long been there. Um, uh, the virtual reality work has kind of found a nice uh, resonance with our moving image collection. So in actual fact, we're dealing with files. Um, the delivery of that is somewhat different, but the artwork is the file. Uh, so that hasn't really changed that much, although, you know, um, in dealing with born, uh, born digital work, we, we do do various other things um, and that's a kind of learning process. Um, with artists who are commissioned, for example, we talk about acquiring a work for 100 years. So what might that work look like when Oculus Rift is no longer producing headsets? Um, what would they be happy with? Do they want to stay with um, the, you know, the kind of what would be fairly old, outdated um, equipment? There are already artists in the collection, um, say Bruce Nauman or artists who prefer a particular aesthetic that's attached to the technology of the time. So they don't want their works to be migrated across um, technology into the future. But um, in the case of <laughs> Jess and Simon at least, they're happy to have those kind of conversations. Um, so... Uh, does that kind of half answer your question? Um, yeah, I mean, it does. It, it's kind of, I was just picturing then, it's kind of that idea that eventually does there become a digital, like a physical space where you can enter the digital space within the gallery where you can then experience all these works that are in a digital library of the kind of work. Is, well, well maybe. Through. That would be pretty cool. But yeah. um, every artist wants something different. Yeah, exactly. No matter what, like um, whether you're working in painting or photography or you know, you're a video artist, you want to, you want the audience to experience your work in a different way. So mm -hmm. I don't think throwing everything into one room is going to be um, yep. sufficient for meeting the artist's requirements. Um, but it would be, I mean, ideally we would have a space, a permanent space for mm -hmm. moving image or uh, new uh, uh, works looking at, um, at new technologies or immersive I think it, immersive I think it took quite some time just to have a dedicated photo space in the gallery and I think that's exactly. changed we're a little bit slow. so it's, <laughs> it's taken a few years um, and then we're, I guess we're working on it yeah um, I'm sure Nick's gonna do some good stuff um, Jess uh, maybe going more kind of individually to your work I and mean, we haven't talked a lot about I guess the conceptual space that these technologies can enter as much and your work in particular isn't uh, even even to a degree um, Jess's work um, that was in the NGA was representational um, rather than say abstract or looking into it was of course dealing with certain psychological elements but it, in a slightly different way where do you see the ability to be able to not just manipulate space as in put objects into weird spaces, but actually manipulate the viewer and objects in space. Where do you see that kind of fitting in your work? And where do you think that being in a digital realm and creating art in that space can actually, what potential do you think that has to take your work into different spaces? Um, yeah, so I am very much interested in visual perception and how we can sort of trick the brain into 
seeing things one way or another. Um, I guess with my work I've always done, well not always, but for the last 10 years or so done abstract work. Um, even my sculptures and physical paintings were abstract. So I was trying to sort of translate those sort of similar sort of ideas, working with the idea of the abject or, you know, gross or sublime sort of alternate things going on. <coughs> I purposely chose to keep pursuing the abstract sort of side of things because I see that so many people in AR are doing really realistic representations um, and I wanted to play with something else. Um, it's interesting though because I feel like my aesthetic has changed since working in AR. You know, uh, there's, there's certain constraints when you're working with um, digital work and these programs like Unity and all this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I'll see how it develops, yeah. Cool. <coughs> um, Just, yeah. sorry, one point to add to that maybe <coughs> is um, at the gallery we had uh, Sean Gladwell's um, Orbital Vanitas yeah. on display as part of Hyperreal. And then we had the Jess Johnson um, Terminus project and the difference yeah. couldn't be more kind of obvious really because I think artists that are using photographic means to just then transport you via the technology and present you with uh, experiences that you could otherwise <coughs> well not that we're going into space but we're all we're all familiar with yeah. that kind of imagery and you were still sat in a chair facing forwards and that's it was right very, exactly yeah. so with Jess and Simon the real excitement came from actually being in a world mm. that was of her imagination yeah. and it was surreal and surrealism is such a big kind of thrust I think in all of this kind of technological science fiction kind of um, space and so the abstraction of of that experience is even even more yeah. exciting. We might just do one kind of I've got kind of two questions that you can answer very quickly hopefully. Um, with each of you just kind of to wrap it up, to put a pin on the end of it and have maybe a little bit almost like more practical advice. So <coughs> what do you think is um, the best thing that people are doing in this kind of space at the moment? And what do you think is the worst thing they're doing or like the biggest opportunity they're missing when approaching <coughs> this way? It doesn't have to be an artist necessarily that you're just seeing in this space. And you know, something like the first thing I saw when somebody's talked about, I saw somebody went, oh, I've heard somebody <coughs> made an AR gallery was it's literally just they'd made a white wall gallery and put the works like on the walls and it's kind of like why do you need the walls like it's a digital space so that kind of thing what do you what do you think's the biggest trip up that people get into and what do you think's kind of the best thing um and if you can't think of it then then maybe just what do you think's the most practical advice to people getting into this space so, i'm going to say something really quick so yeah <laughs> answer your question um there's this thing in filmmaking, uh, well, not filmmaking, moving image production and video production that um, you can you can make this fantastic work and then you can um, take stills from that work and then addition them as photographs and then sell them. Um, and I would hate for the virtual space to do the same thing. I would hate for it to just be an image capturing process which then is kind of like sold as photographic stills. Um, I think that the best thing that people can do at the moment is work and really push interactivity in the AR space, like Shannon mentioned. I think that that's a really exciting area. Um, but I think the worst thing is where people just take work that they've already previously made in the real world and just plonk it into AR, sort of like the Jeff Koons app that you are uh, part of, was it Snapchat? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it just... Seemed a bit boring to me. Yeah, a bit straightforward. Pardon? Yeah. Um, okay, so I think the best thing is uh, getting rid of limits. Um, you know, anyone should be able to experience anything. Um, you know, I think that's that's a real advantage and a real exciting thing. Um, from a from a personal thing, one of the things that I really hate that people are trying to use VR is um, there's a lot of cheap jump thrill horror games out there at the moment. Um, you know, and it really, it just irks me. So it's, it's sort of like that that classic sort of, you know, bad B-grade horror where all they do is just blast the sound really high as a, as a something jumps in front of you sort of thing. And I just think that's, that, that might appeal to some people, but I think that's just a waste of the technology from a personal perspective. Um, 
maybe just quickly, is there any one place or one artist you would recommend that people go out there to look at? No? Jess? Oh, sorry. I think there's one artist, I think her name is Nancy, I think it's Baker Carhill. She's on Instagram. She's done an app called Fourth Wall um, and that's really, really exciting. Um, she had a drawing practice like Jess Johnson um, and she's transforming her drawing practice into AR and it's, it's really quite amazing. There's lots of artists um, and I probably shouldn't like recommend a couple that we're about to work with, but uh, <laughs> soon to be announced. Um, but if you haven't seen Terminus, um, do try to see it when it's travelling Australia because it is a phenomenal work. <coughs> um, we're really, really happy with it and it's owned by all Australians. Um, it kickstarts its travelling exhibition at Heidi in Melbourne uh, next November and then we'll tour Australia in a, what's that, clockwise fashion. Cool. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you all for joining us. Can you please quickly thank our panel? <laughs> please thank our lovely sign interpreter. <laughs> and our lovely pair of Nicks who have helped support everything to do with this event. Uh, and just a quick note, I don't know if anyone's actually in, we did have a huge amount of issues with the live stream, it turns out. So we do have it all captured though, and I believe they've captured all the audio. So we're going to get them all synced up, we're going to get the, the live captions placed on the bottom of it, and we will get the video out there so people can either watch it later. But if anyone is hearing on this, we do apologise profusely for that. Could I get a round of applause for Daniel Savage? For producing and facilitating the movie suite. And one more round for the whole panel. We um, we've got the, the bar will be open for a little bit longer and obviously there's all kinds of fun uh, material around for you to have a little go with. So please feel free. And obviously uh, the panelists will be around for a few more minutes if you want to hit them up. I'll just say that that's probably my biggest thing to say to do is talk to people because everyone has made a mistake that you're going to make when you try to do IR and they've probably figured a workaround. The amount of times that people ask me something at work and I go, oh yeah, I'll fix that and Google it and then fix it for them. <laughs> just yeah, talk to people and, put, and own up to like what you're having trouble with because somebody else has probably found a fix and the biggest barrier is those, like, those digital elements where you turn it on it just doesn't work. So talk to people and hopefully that's what the next half an hour while you guys are still here can be that you can actually talk to each other. Killer advice. Please stick around and uh, make use of it.